Hello, my name is Judy Madron, and this is a sound sketch of John Greenwood. John is one of just a few members of the Vintage Automobile Racing Association of Canada who raced at Mosport in 1961 when the track was new. Back then, he was driving an Austin Sprite, and he says Mosport was a much different place. He drives a Lotus 7 now, and his enthusiasm and energy for racing is unchanged. John was born in Scotland, and after a full career in Canada in the auto industry, he continues to take part in races and as an instructor teaches others the fine points of racing. John and I are recording this profile of his love affair with automobiles at his home in Oshawa on the morning of September 7th, 2011. Good morning, John. Well, it may not be called a love affair. I, I made my living in automobiles. Um, I came from Scotland, you know, as a trained mechanic, just got my papers then, and, and I arrived in Canada and got a job in, you know, like a, a, a repair shop. And how old were you? I was exactly 21. I arrived in Canada on my 21st birthday on Christmas Day. And why did you come to Canada? Oh, <laughs> you know, I thought that I could skate in Canada for free. I actually had some idea the, the streets were covered in ice and I could skate to work. Believe it or not, I was a very keen skater and I had to pay admission to get into an ice rink in Scotland. Now, you also trained to be a mechanic there, so why, why did you decide to learn how to fix cars? Oh, that was actually a bit of a mistake as well. When I left school, uh, I had gotten very, very high marks in uh, what they called mechanics. And really what it was was uh, geometry and, and algebra and physics all rolled into one. And the school at that time called the entire group mechanics. And I really honestly wanted to become more of a draftsman or engineer or whatever. However, you know, my family was just working class and couldn't really afford to send me to, you know, some kind of a college or whatever to to continue that. So my mother had talked to my schoolmaster and she, you know, learned that I was good at mechanics, very good at mechanics as, as it turned out to be. So she went to a local garage and got me a job as a, an apprentice mechanic. So it, it really was a mistake. <laughs> but anyway, I stuck it out and, you know, I don't regret it ever since because I finished up with cars. But it, it really never was a love affair, I can assure you. You began work servicing cars here. Can you, can you give me a quick overview of your career with cars? Maybe not a love affair on, on that <laughs> part of it, but... I, I started at a shop, and it was called Shelton Mansell Motors, owned by two, oh, I'm guessing at that time there'd be two 40-year-old men, that, um, and they serviced uh, British sports cars. And both these guys were involved in racing. And, of course, I think the first year that I arrived, I went out to a few races with them just as a, as a helper, you know, and kind of changing some brakes, etc. Then another fellow, he was a Scottish guy named Bill Simpson, suggested that if I would fix his car, then I could drive it in novice races. In those days, they had, I think they were called national drivers and novices. So, we, so that that's how I started. Was I that I started driving his car novice? And the interesting part was. I never lost. I, I won every race in, as a novice that I entered. Um, actually, the first race I was in, uh, I was terrified to lose. Absolutely terrified because all these guys around me were all, in, in my mind, you know, great, great racers, and therefore I couldn't show up being, you know, like bad. But, I, but honestly, I was terrified. And where were those first races? The first races that we went to were at. Um, Harewood and Greenacres, and those are old airports. Um, and uh, Harewood is down by Simcoe County in um, Lake Ontario, and then the other one was uh, was up 
Green Acres was up by Godrich. I think Godrich is on Lake Huron, is it not? Somewhere around here, I've still got a whole bunch of old tarnished trophies lying around from the uh, the early, like in 1959, I think I, I started racing it. I want to get into that era, but just give me a very quick, what happened after you finished fixing cars, the rest of your automobile career, not your racing career? I, I guess the thing is, is that uh, all of my life have been involved in the car business, I guess, one way or another. You know, after working for 10 years at Shelton Mansell, you know, I moved to another place, you know, just to try to earn some more money, and then another place. And I eventually finished up at a silly place called Ken Brown Motors, and, and they did Jaguars and Rolls Royce. The boss kept coming, telling me how to change a sparking plug or something like that. He was a silly old bugger, quite honestly, but... Uh, from there, I couldn't stand. What I, what I did was I looked in the mirror one day and I said, by the time I'm 30 years old, I'm not going to be working on the bench any longer, like as a mechanic. And I think around about when I was about 28 years old, I found a, a vacant gas station in Richmond Hill, and I applied, it was a BP gas station, and I applied to BP if I could take it over, and I did. The repairs for British cars kept coming in and coming in, and I got busier and busier. Eventually, I started selling a few cars off the lot. And then I found a, a, um, an empty shell station, and I bought it so I could open my own garage. I built it and then eventually knocked the gas station down and built a, a proper shop and I started selling uh, Renault for a while. Then Peugeot came to talk to me, and so I finished up having Renault and Peugeot. I used to turn the radios, if, if I had a car in the showroom, like a Renault in the showroom, I turned the radio onto a, a French station, and when people came in and they were playing with the car, they could only get French. <laughs> and I said, that's the way they come. <laughs> <laughs> I had a funny joke with that. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed it. Then along came Volvo. Volvo came to me because they had lost one of their uh, better dealerships, which was at Young and Steel's. We finished up selling Volvos for a number of years. Then Hyundai came on the scene with, at that time, the, the Hyundai Pony. And they came to me, I guess it was because of my location on Young Street in Richmond Hill. And uh, anyway, I finished up getting Hyundai Pony, and I kept Volvo. But by that time, you know, I had, I had let go of Renault and Peugeot. So I finished up getting Hyundai Pony, and, and really, uh, they were easy to sell. Meanwhile, every weekend, you're <laughs> at the racetrack. Is that the picture? Pretty much, yeah. I, I, I spent a lot of times in the evenings after work or sales or whatever going in and fixing my race cars up. And, and yeah, I did race. At this point in time, during this sort of building part going through the uh, this sort of Volvo era, I think from about, uh, about 1970, I, I, can t I, I raced up till about 1973, I think, and gave it up for maybe four or five years. Uh, even though I'd given it up, I still used to go out to every event anyway, you know, and, uh, you know, work as a scrutineer or a, or some form of helper in the races at the, at the weekends, you know, although I just didn't drive for that, that few years. I went out to a vintage race at Shannonville in 1981. And they had Sterling Moss had come over for that race. I remember that point. And I went out there and I saw all of these cars and just fell in love all over again. Look, those are cars like, I, I used to have them. I drove them. Da, 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 da. You know, so I, uh, um, you, you know, I just simply just, uh, came out of that race and I said, I'm going to get myself one of them. Meaning a vintage car. A vintage car, yeah. Which wasn't a vintage car when I started racing. But anyway, I... Um, so let's go back yeah, to the 19, uh, late 1950s. You're an auto mechanic. Yeah. You're, you're racing somebody's car that you fix on the other in the real world. 
how did you get from driving somebody else's car to being, you know, steadily involved? Well, um, I was driving, as I said, someone else's car, and he was a, an engineer from the Harlander Douglas, one of the aircraft companies, and they moved him to California for his expertise, and his car was saying, was there. So I continued fixing the car for myself and racing it, and then I bought the car from him. So the car became mine, and so I just continued racing it every weekend. And it was not, at that point, a vintage car. No, it wasn't. The car that I was driving was a 1960 Sprite, you know, and of course, most sport opened in 19... 19- 61, so really the car was only about two years old. So tell me a bit more about those early days of racing. What was a race like? The early days of racing are are so, so completely different than they are here today. Um, There really was almost no safety um, anything. We, I I have to kind of think back in this. Some cars had roll bars in them, But I don't think they were mandatory. You know, I do remember making a roll bar for my Lotus 7, and it was was like a piece of bent wire, you know, so I, but it was my idea of a roll bar. But I'll go back to the Sprite. I think this, yeah, I think the early Sprite had a roll bar in it. But one of the things that was very common in those days was that every car had what was called a chicken handle on the floor. And the idea was that if the car was going to roll over, you sort of dive down to the floor to grab the chicken handle and hang on so that you didn't get your head crushed. No seatbelt? No, there were no seatbelts, no. No. In fact, um, there may have been, some cars may have had lap belts, but the thing was that the, you know, the sort of reports you got out of Stuff was that Sterling Moss didn't use a street seat belt, so therefore if Sterling Moss doesn't use a seat belt, why should I? You know, like it must be the right thing to do. And in those days, like guys were being thrown out of their cars as they were rolling over and the car would roll over on top of them. And I know quite honestly, um, but the other thing was, was that the practice, today we sort of practice in groups and the groups are all fairly equal so that the car speeds and weights and stuff are all fairly equal. But in those days, they just simply said, it's practice uh, from you know 10 till 11, and the gates were just open, and off you went to practice. And uh, you came, you practiced for a while, came in, and went back out again, and so there was cars coming and going. Um, What's the challenge of having various weights and speeds and power on the same track at the same time. Well, the the challenge on it is the fact that the cars are going at hugely different speeds, and um, we would at times, like I I raced at Motorsport, and there were professional drivers on the track with with Ferraris and Chaparrals and Gardeners, all what, and they would pass you like you were, you know, painted on the track. Honestly, they would just appear in an instant and be past you in two instants. So that that was how it was done. That's a lot of challenge for a practice. <laughs> Tell me about a race. Well, uh, the races would be open to all comers, pretty much. Although you would have been classed, there were class uh, distinctions, but you finished up racing on the track with all of the different sty- types and styles of cars. You know, if you if you had a sports car, you were out with the sports cars, and and as I said, that included uh, a lot like uh, the professionals. If if it if it happened to be a a, a big weekend at Motorsport, you know, you would have uh, uh, Jim Clark and and Sterling Moss and uh, Dan Gurney and all of the famous uh, people. You know, and they they were just like everyone else when you when you met them in the paddock. They were just racing drivers. You know, and they they were very. Uh, easy to get along with and chat. You know, and they, I, I remember standing in a in a line at the restaurant, and Graham Hill, who was a world champion at the time, was standing right in front of me, like you know, just chatting away with another driver, but waiting in, waiting in line for his two dollar breakfast. <laughs> I'm interested. You said that that, that it, there would be classes and various distinctions, but you would be on the track with quite a wide range of capability in terms of the cars, is that right? That's correct, yeah. 
Oh, that sounds kind of scary to me. Well, you know, the thing is that when I was young, or like any young guy, you're, you're pretty much immortal. You know, the last thing you think of is being scared. You know, it, was, it was very, very thrilling and very exciting, I must admit. Did you ever have a bad race, I, uh, uh, one that was um, threatening to your life? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. Yeah, at um, at most sport, I don't know what year it may have been, sixty one, but it was certainly in the early days of most sport, and you know, most sport was quite a different place then. You know, the the track has got barriers and safety here and runoff areas and so forth. In those days, the track was lined with um, earth berms, but they, yeah, there were high banks. Uh, there was either nothing at all, like in other words, there was just simply grass, and you would run into a tree or something, or there were these high berms. And I know at the hairpin, you approach the hairpin at a very, very high speed. It's one of the fastest parts on the track because it's straight downhill, and then it suddenly got a little kick uphill. Anyway, I was coming straight downhill, flat out, as fast as I could go in my Sprite and I stuck my foot in the brake to take the hairpin and the brake pedal hit the floor. And of course there's a great berm right ahead of you so I finished up, I tried to spin the car but wasn't totally successful so I, you leave your braking to the very very last instant you know and of course I'm, the car was doing I'm guessing about 120 miles an hour going down this hill and basically you uh, you have got no nowhere to go. I was right, right to you know. I would think probably less than a half a second between touching the brake and hitting the berm. And what happened? Well, the car turned over about four or five times, like um, end over end, like like nose to tail. It actually spun on its nose. I'm told there was pictures of the car standing on its on its nose spinning. Anyway, then it flipped over and. Um, but that's right, the car did have a roll bar at that time. And were you holding on to the no, chicken? No, that, that I, I don't think it was possible to do that. You, you don't have enough time to, to do that. It, it was, you know, it was the known thing to do that you must have one of these chicken handles in your car, but I don't, I never heard of anyone who, uh, who had enough uh, speed and their agility to be able to go from sitting in the driver's seat to grabbing this chicken handle while the car was spinning, was, was flipping over. You Were know. you hurt? No, 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 I was, I, I was actually mad. I was, uh, I stepped out of the car with, with not, a, not a scratch. You know, I've never been hurt racing. I've, uh, I've raced for, what I would say, like over 50 years. I've never ever, you know, broken a fingernail. Why is that? I don't know, lucky I think. I mean, I, I've crashed many, many, many cars. I think I've broken almost every limb in my body through other like, misadventures, but it had nothing to do with racing or even skiing. I skied for, uh, for years and years, but never ever you know, broke a fingernail skiing. But, uh, you know, like tripping over a, a, a step or something, you know, like a bang, there goes a broken ankle, there's a broken elbow, there's a whatever. In the early days of uh, most part, are there any characters that surface for you? Oh, I think the place is filled with characters. I really do. Back in the back in the early days, there was back in the you know, Green Acres and uh, I've forgotten this fellow's name now. You know the 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 character in Peanuts was called the the dust. The guy that's always covered in, in dirt, like it's always a, a cloud of dirt follows him. Yes. Well, there was a character in, in the early days, and that's what he looked like. His face was always black, his hands were black, and he came from, I think, Cornwall, England. And of course, he had one of these uh, R by kind of an accent, and he would talk all the time like R by. And he just sounded like a, like a pirate, like with a peg leg, you know. And he was a total character because he would take a perfectly good race car that he would buy and totally destroy it by putting in a stupid engine from something else. Um, I remember he had, a, he had bought a, a, one of the best, it was a Lotus 15, and at that time was probably one of the hottest cars in the world at the time. And of course, 
you know, it was just something for us to go and look at. And he took the engine out of it, which was a racing Coventry Climax engine, and he put in an old engine from an old Austin A40. He says, because an Austin engine, she'd be a grand engine. She'd work good. And of course, the car was as slow as a snail. I mean, I, I can't even remember his name. I, I think some of the old guys from from, from racing would remember him. He was around uh, all that. I, I don't remember him much after most sports started. The races were run by mostly uh, clubs, which they are today even. Um, there were, you know, seven or eight races around here in the in a season. And then, you know, we would go to Quebec a bit. When Mont Long opened up in 1964, I was at the very first race that was held in, in, in Mont Tremblant. And when you raced at Mosport, what did it cost you? Do you know, it may have been $25. I think I recall when we went to Harewood and Greenacres, I believe it was $18. It's all relative, isn't it? Because, um, you know, I think my pay was about 52 I, I remember $52 was, was what I got paid. Uh, in my pay packet, you know, and a race was say eighteen dollars. So it's so it's kind of relative, uh, you know. Like t today, we, you know, like a race at most board is three hundred and sixty-five dollars. Now there's about forty bucks of that is tied up to Mr. McGinty and his uh, HSD, but uh, that's a another sore point with me. So when you're uh, back again, we're talking the early '60s and on. You have the cost of entering your car in the race, which you said was about 25. Then you've got to keep your car, you've got gas, so... And your $8 uh, string driving gloves, your Sterling Moss uh, driving gloves, and your helmet, which would be made of cork, and it was called a corker. And it was very much like a, a polo helmet, you know, you know not like the, uh, the all-encompassing helmets we have today. You know, today, to go racing, probably cost you about 1500 to 2000 dollars just for your uh, your driving gear now as you say the you know, getting back to safety obviously this was the intention of it is that you wear a three layer uh, driving suit and it's obviously to give you some fire protection uh, but when you started it was some good gloves for gripping the wheel yeah and a corker a corker yeah that's it yeah and you and you went along wearing your you know, your regular shirt or T-shirt or whatever you happen to be wearing. In those days, there weren't too many people actually wore T-shirts. You know, mainly they wore just a, uh, you know, a cotton shirt. And, and yeah, that's, that's how you went driving, with a short-sleeved cotton shirt and, and your, your little hat and your Sterling Moss gloves. There must have been some horrific accidents. Yeah, yeah, there were. There were... Um, uh, you know, a few um, fatalities in the early days of racing when I was there. There was always a f kind of a sad thing around because, as, as I said, they, it just simply, yeah, people had been, during races that I was at, had been thrown out of their cars and uh, uh, and the car rolled on top of them. Other cases where I recall there was a fellow, you know, that got rear-ended at most sport. Like, in other words, a faster car came up over a hilltop and he was driving slowly, and, and I, I think he may have been sort of maybe broken down or, or whatever, but he was driving slowly, and another car hit him in the back, and, it, and that, that, of course, uh, whiplash, you know, but you know the, the effect of that. But after that, for instance, um, we had mandated to have cars with uh, head restraints on them, you know, and you've probably seen a bit now that everyone is wearing a uh, hands device. Hands device is a acronym for a head and neck support. And you've seen lots of things when you see the, a driver walking around with a kind of a little plastic thing on his shoulders um, and it, it's attached to the helmet. And that's the intention of it, is, is the, to keep the head from whipping back. Um, this came out from uh, I think from the, the, the death of Dale Earnhardt, which turned out to be a NASCAR driver. You know, they were good old boys that could never get hurt, except when one of their stars got killed. Um, 
you know, they decided that maybe they even needed some safety, you know. So the difference then and now, safety is a big difference in terms of what's been put in place. The, uh, the protection around the raceway itself has changed from a berm to space, right? Yeah, There's that's a lot right. Of yeah. space and fencing. Any other regulations that there is a great difference now between then and now? Oh yeah, the the regulations are now the uh, that we also uh, drive in groups that are similar in 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 speed and weight, and especially weight, you know, because the fact that a uh, a light car being hit by a heavy car is obviously going to be a bad situation. Um, I mean, if you look at how things are today and modern. Uh, as they are today, like really vintage racing should not exist if they want to carry out the letter of the law because really uh, you know some vintage cars simply cannot be made safe and still look vintage. you know they would look like a uh, an armored car um, my lotus for instance you know i'm I'm quite exposed uh, like to a side impact, and I'm aware of that. And I kind of have to accept it, you know. And 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 like I said to you uh, at the beginning, um, you know, I've been racing for fifty years and have never broken a fingernail, even though, quite honestly, I was um, uh, hit broadside one time by another car going at a fairly high speed. But I presume that the car that hit me was also a fairly light car, and all it did was like, you know, bent my car and and moved us. But uh, you know. Is that part of the thrill of racing? I no, I quite honestly, I never think about it, and and I don't, I don't think uh, uh, most. I think if you thought about it, you just simply wouldn't race. I really do. the The thrill when I was younger was the thrill of of beating the guy beside you, and I guess to a point it is today. I mean, racing and vintage racing, I I just. Uh, love the camaraderie of of uh, being with people who understand what what it's all about and and racing with them, you know they they race very very hard they race uh, very close to each other, you know within inches but we never ever touch on purpose anyway, uh, you know whereas I think in NASCAR they're forever thumping each other um, but they're covered with with um, you know armored plating you know they've got a very light car but they but they interior, you know, the roll cage is in a, a modern car is, uh, you know, it, it's great. You said that when you started racing, you, you won. What are you good at? <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm just a short wee fella and, and not particularly good at anything. You know, I, I used to be a very, very good skater. Um, I used to ski quite well. I kind of, I used to be kind of half good at a lot of things, but never really great at anything. And the same with racing. I, I've, um, uh, I was certainly a, a better racer when I was young. I mean, today I'm, uh, uh, you know, all I can do is tell better lies than the <laughs> the guys when I go when I go racing. I can just spin a better story and uh, and uh, and tell you how good I used to be. But anyway, that's. Uh, and a race that sticks in your memory. I think, like vintage racing that stick in my memory is when I, I've gone to uh, the Pittsburgh Grand Prix many times, and the Pittsburgh Grand Prix is just an absolutely amazing event, where they have closed off a number of roads in a park in Pittsburgh. It's called Shanley Park, and it's amazingly dangerous. And it just excites the hell out of me. It really does. You, you know, you drive around a particular corner. I recall there's one particular corner where there's a very high curb, and you're heading past it at 90 miles an hour. And my elbow, I have actually got to lift my elbow from the outside of the car because I think I'm going to hit it. I probably won't, but uh, but it gives you that, that impression. Does anybody else in your family race? Uh, no, there's, uh, there's no one, not during my... My lifetime, that I have any uh, uh, family. As I said, I, I came to Canada on my own. I was married, and my wife, she 
kind of put up with racing, but There's she... There's a story about the honeymoon, I think. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, um, When we got married, we got married on Grey Cup Day, which I guess is sometime in the 25th of November, and uh, we, our honeymoon was to be held in Nassau, Bahamas, and it just happened to be that uh, that I already knew that Nassau, Bahamas had the, the Nassau Speed Week, so we... We went to our honeymoon, and I think every day we finished up going out to the track at uh, in the Bahamas to watch the watch the racing. <laughs> so, anyway, I guess my my wife kind of got indoctrinated by fire, you know. So, so that, she that did strike me when I visited Mosport. It is a quite an amazing community. Yeah. If somebody now wanted to begin uh, to get involved, what advice would you give them? Well, the First advice I would give them is, is go find a, a, a an already built race car. So many people, you know, look up and they find a a car that is uh, they 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 feel it's an old, it's old enough to go vintage racing, and then they're going to convert it into a race car, and they find that the costs are much more than they thought it were going to be because they kind of just didn't estimate it well. You know, well, I'll fix it myself. I'll do my own work, and they find they can't do it, and so and so. A lot of people get discouraged from racing. So the advice would obviously go, and if you can find, you know, like you you know what your budget is to go racing, um, get a car that's already built, and and um, go racing. But if you do race a car that hasn't been raced before, then if you need to read the rules carefully you know, and check on eligibility because the fact that a lot of times people think that they can just simply take a car and I'm going to make this car real fast, you know, but you, you can't go vintage racing that way. I'm also imagining that there are several people who would be happy to mentor. Oh, absolutely. If you go out to a, a, a race and go vintage racing, you know, you will have a host of people who will be, you know, there to help you. You start off racing by going to driver school you know, and I'm, for instance, I'm a, a race driver instructor, so I always ask, when possible, to get the the vintage students under my care, even the ones that are tutored by other instructors. You know, I always get them at the end of the driving school, have a bit of a meeting with them to try to explain to them what the whole idea of vintage is in vintage racing and the, and the fun aspect of the fact that, you know, we really don't go out there you know, to hurt other people just to win a race. Winning a race is is less important than having fun. Yeah. I was talking yesterday to a fellow from Quebec who is just getting into vintage racing, and he's so excited. He sounds like a like a kid, and yet he's reached retirement age, so he's obviously not a kid. But uh, he he sounded like a kid when he was, uh, you know, talking about you know his this opportunity to go vintage racing. So. Great. This has been a sound sketch of John Greenwood, a longtime vintage racer and former president of the Vintage Automobile Racing Association of Canada. I'm Judy Madron. Mm-hmm.